take you back just a little bit from where we are in the gospel. <clears throat> Remind you that Jerusalem had a king at the time when Jesus was born. And when Herod had heard that a baby had been born in Bethlehem, oh, he acted swiftly and with great power. He sent his military to slaughter all the young boys in Bethlehem and the surrounding vicinities. Herod was afraid for his own throne. And knowing that power does not remain long in the hands of the weak, he struck without mercy. Of course, Jesus, the infant, escaped through the warning of an angel and the quick action of his mother and father. They made their way to Egypt. And now, at the age of 33, Jesus returned to Jerusalem. Amid the shouts of children who waved their palm branches, along with their parents who were shouting and chanting, has Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Oh, do be careful of what you say, even in the Middle East today, of where your allegiances are. Jerusalem has not just a king, it has an emperor, ruled by the Roman Caesar, who has installed his governor, Pontius Pilate, who himself now oversees all the politics of the city of Jerusalem. It's best to remain a friend of Caesar. And under his authority, another one from the family of Herod, although hardly a king of the Jews. No, the real power over the hearts and the minds of the people lay with the religious leaders, scribes, Sadducees, teachers of the law, and most importantly, Pharisees. They were all the ones who controlled the temple life, the worship practices. They were the ones who weighed down the people with awful rules that, that weighed them down like pack animals. And they were unwilling to lift a finger to help them keep these rules. These were the people who were afraid, who were alarmed when they heard that Jesus was entering the city to the shouts of the people, Hosanna, Hosanna. They could feel the power slipping from their grasp even in that very moment. For there was no denying in the minds of the masses the miracles and the power that Jesus possessed. Why, just a few days earlier, outside the city of Bethany, Jesus had been spotted in the tombs. And this was confirmed by the Pharisees' own witnesses who testified that Jesus was there at the tomb of Lazarus. And though he'd been dead for four days, commanded that the entrance of the tomb be opened. And there he commanded and called his name. And Lazarus walked out of the tombs alive. Oh, the whole city now is just a buzz with the rumors. What further proof do we need? Is this not the one we've been waiting for? Is this not King David's son? Is this not the king of Israel? Yes. But power does not remain long in the hands of the weak. If Jesus were going to capitalize on this brown swell of public and mass approval, if he is going to take the city, he will have to do it in a very different fashion than riding in on a donkey. He needs to come in on a war horse. His men need to be armed and ready to take control of the city and the temple. But instead, he comes in peace as, as if the battle for the city had already been fought and won. He comes as a king in victory. But all this time, there are those who are plotting and planning viciously to take his life. Even as the whole world seems to have gone after him with their praises. No, this time the soldiers will find him. This time the rival king will be killed. And so it was. Jesus did not resist capture. 
did not try to escape either politically or physically overpowering those who had taken him. He quickly went from hail Hosanna to crucify him in a matter of days. This story of Jesus is hardly inspiring at all. This is not somebody that you would want running your country. Certainly not someone as a leader for our own country. No, we want somebody strong who can make tough decisions about our budget, about our deficits, about which battles to fight in the world. We want someone who will stand up for our American way of life in the world, our values, our principles, and protect our rights and privileges here at home. And if this leader is to be God himself, the ultimate leader, we have some expectations about God, too, if he's going to be our king and leader. We expect that when we pray to God, things happen. There will be blessings. If someone is sick in our family, we all gather and pray. There better be a healing. And when we pray for our young ones who will be driving soon, we pray that they'll be kept safe. <laughs> and when we pray, we expect the blessings, and if we don't get them, is God really in our people? It's interesting that as soon as, as we elect a leader, you know, where, where is this, this divine leader? Where is this human leader that will give us what we want and expect? For as soon as we elect somebody into office, hopeful for change and expectations, we are quickly disappointed by their weaknesses and inability to bring about the prosperity that we expect. And this goes not only politically, but even in the church. How many times have churches been so excited to extend a call to a pastor or a church worker only to get the pastor and the church worker? We are even disappointed with the hand, the almighty hand of God, who does not powerfully provide for us. So you know what that means for us? That means we're going to have to take control of our own lives. And we kind of assumed we were going to have to do that anyway. That's kind of our default setting. That if anything's going to happen, it's going to be up to me. And I will get it done. But certainly this saying applies to us as well. That power does not remain long in the hands of the weak. And if you think you can take control of your life, if you really think you can control the destiny of your family and the world, then why not try and change the gas price? <laughs> why not try and create all the jobs that are needed in our country right now? Why, why not just do something local here and really try and control all those reckless drivers we encounter here in Wichita? <laughs> or try and heal yourself when you're sick or turn back the clock of aging? We're so much in control. Why aren't we? In fact, we are not in control because there are powers and uh, beyond natural disasters. There is something set out against us, and it's beyond even the demonic or Satan himself. It is God who stands against us. It is God who stands against us to judge. There's a popular tattoo among athletes and rock stars, and it says, only God can judge me. Well, he does. And he condemns you. For all of us have rejected his rule in our lives, and we have enthroned ourselves as king. And even us who've been gathered here to worship, even us who would gladly sing the songs of Hosanna and wave our palm branches, it's when we want to do what we want to do. And we establish ourselves as the rule maker. Well, I know God says this is wrong, but I'm going to do it. Because this is what I need to do to take control of my life. But our reign as kings will end with our death. What is Jesus, king of Israel, doing? He's being held onto a donkey. He's riding into a city to face the one who stands close to us. Not the 
political, but the divine. Jesus, without weapons, without superior arguments, without an army, but humble, passive, he goes to Jerusalem. There he is rejected by Herod, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the people, and Pontius Pilate, who all condemn him, saying, you're not our king. And there, hanging on the cross, he faces the one who ultimately stands against us. And he receives in himself the condemnation, the judgment. And he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But in so doing, Jesus leads us out of judgment. He leads us out of the condemnation that we stand under before God. He leads us out of death and into life. See your king comes, gentle, riding on the donkey. Your king of peace comes to you, offering a peace that you cannot control yourself, that you cannot obtain yourself, that you cannot get in this world. It is a peace that is right here and now for you. And just to hear these words is not what God and the Lord Jesus has for you. To actually receive this peace is the gift. How, how do you receive this gift? I need, I need this peace. This peace comes brokenness and humility as we realize that I have no control, ultimate control in this world. But my God does. That though I have rebelled against him, he has taken that rebellion on himself. And I am at peace. And though I have acted very unlovingly, he loves me. He wants me. And I need See, this is more than just an inspired story. Jesus is the King of heaven and earth. He is your King who brings this peace. We are His people. And so it is appropriate that on this day it be on our lips these words. Together we say them. Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God. He has made his light shine on us. With God's hand, join in the festival procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Take this Psalm 118, the whole thing. During this holy week when we will go to the supper, when we will go to Good Friday, when we will see the empty tomb, take this Psalm 118 and make it your devotion for the week and read it over and allow the King of Peace to bring his peace to your heart. Amen.